Now we're going to have a discussion with two leading figures in the sports area, uh, Phil DiPascito. Um, Phil is um, the founder and president of Octagon, and Phil is a uh, person who has built Octagon into being the, probably the largest sports and uh, entertainment agency firm in the world. Um, he has 50 offices around the world, and he uh, founded it a number of years ago after leaving, uh, transitioning from another firm called Advantage International. Uh, Phil is a graduate of Amherst and University of Pennsylvania Law School, and like me, he decided to do things other than practice law. Um, so Phil has about 800 employees now and manages some 13,000 sporting events around the world every year. Uh, Mark Ein is a person who is a native of the Washington area, went to uh, Bethesda Chevy Chase High School, where he was captain of the tennis team, uh, then went to University of Pennsylvania and Harvard Business School. He started his career in Washington and at the well-known Carlisle Group, where I managed to hire uh, Mark. Uh, it was a very good decision. He worked for us for about seven or eight years, then went out on his own to start Venture House uh, Group, which is a very entrepreneurial type business enterprise. And among the other things that Mark has done, in addition to his philanthropy in the area that I'll mention in a moment, uh, Mark has um, uh, bought uh, the, the Washington Castles. He's the owner of that. For a while, he owned the World Team Tennis uh, Tour as well. He also is the owner of the City Open, which is the tennis tournament that's being held in the Washington area and has been for many, many years. And he's also the owner of Lindblad and also Castle Key Company, which many of you probably use to go into your buildings. So Phil and uh, Mark, welcome very much to uh, our, our little broadcast. Thanks for having us. Thanks, David. Thanks for keeping us informed and connected. Okay, so Phil, uh, let me start with you. Are we going to have a baseball season this year? I think I just uh, read that, that the Major League Baseball people finally said, yes, we're going to have a 60-game season. Is that going to happen? It looks like there will be a baseball season, albeit a shortened one, uh, probably 60 games in the usual stadia, except maybe for the Blue Jays due to Canadian governmental restrictions. Uh, but the schedule will be regionalized to limit travel for all teams. The owners want fewer games as they will lose money for each game played if they have to pay the players on a full prorated basis in accordance with their existing contracts. And the irony is that not all teams are treated similarly. The best attended and best performing teams in the big markets like the Yankees and the Dodgers get hurt the most as they have the most fans. Those with normally low fan attendance are going to be hurt the least. So uh, the timing of the next collective bargaining negotiation in baseball is another reason that baseball is in a tough position. Um, this threatens the 2022 season, but it looks like they will play. So when they play, of course, they're playing, but they're having no fans. Is that right? There are not going to be any fans. That's right. There's no plan to have fans. And the reason that they're not all doing this in Florida or Arizona is just there's no reason to do that. They all have their own stadiums. It's different than basketball. Well, you know, there's... Uh, the, the reopening of sports shows how divergent opinions are. Every sport is treated differently. And the news of the last 24 hours reminds us how complicated this all is and the different circumstances and the governance of each sport are leading to very different outcomes. So for example, we're not likely to see indoor events with fans this year, or at least not for the current seasons. And eventually the development of a therapeutic, maybe not even waiting as far as a vaccine goes, uh, largely keeping people out of the hospital may be enough to get some fans uh, to take the risk to come to games if governments allow people to congregate. And baseball is counting, I think, on allowing teams to play in their home markets because they've decided that it's the best thing for them. So what about basketball? Basketball is definitely coming back, but it's all going to be based in Orlando. Is that right? Yes. Um, the NBA uh, bubble is being implemented under a very detailed 113-page health and safety protocol. The idea is essentially to shrink wrap the players. They're gonna bring the players into the bubble after they test COVID free. They'll test them every day. They won't let them leave so as to keep them COVID free for a couple of months to finish the existing season. And then presumably they'll do it all over again to start the next season. And if a player somehow tests positive, despite these controls, that individual will be removed and the rest will continue to, to play. Contact tracing is easiest within a bubble. So the hope is that they can prevent a substantial spike. And what about the NFL? What are the NFL going to do? Well, the NFL um, is intending to play. 
but football players may be the most at risk of all athletes because of their size and their general health, uh, not necessarily because of the contact in the sport. Basketball has arguably closer contact with less protection uh, because basketball is played indoors and there are no helmets. But football is, is risky, and the biggest risk is that they're planning to compete as usual with no bubble. So the health of the players is a major concern. Even a small sustained loss of lung capacity for a top athlete could be career threatening. And I think you're starting to hear the voices of the players rise to say, we're not sure that playing or starting on time is a very good idea. College football is, supports many athletic programs of many leading universities. If college football is not played, what will happen to the athletic programs of so many major universities? Yeah, David, you're right. It, it, it's a major risk. Um, I think college football will be played only if campuses mm -hmm. reopen. Um, there's no sensible discussion around student athletes alone returning to campus in order to preserve the season, despite the financial hardship that canceling seasons will have on some of the larger schools. But even with campuses open, there's a recognition that intercollegiate sports involve more risk for student athletes from contact and travel than is the case for student non-athletes. And I think you'll see decisions being made very individually, conference by conference, sport by sport, and sometimes even school by school within a conference. So the big football schools in the South and Southeast uh, are the most likely to play, uh, maybe even with some fans, though probably with an altered schedule that doesn't involve as much travel, maybe fewer games as not all the schools will decide to play. The college basketball season is too far off to predict. But speaking of amateur sports, you know, this period has also been a reminder that the foundation of college sports and actually our entire industry begins at the youth level. And there we have an enormous national public health crisis, obesity, healthcare costs, et cetera, because of the lack of accessibility and equality in physical activity and youth sports. So we're working with a lot of other people to try to solve this problem through a number of initiatives led by the corporate community and supported by owners like Mark Cuban who are looking past the present into the future. Hey, Mark, uh, can I ask you about tennis? The City Open is something that you, have, you now own. Uh, is the City Open going to occur a normal schedule and are there gonna be fans or what, what are you gonna have? Yeah, so thank you, David. Yeah, so the City Open has been played in Washington for 51 straight years, and we just announced last week that it's going to be the first tennis tournament back in the world um, after, since the beginning of March when the tour was put on hold. Um, we are moving back two weeks, so we're going to play in Washington, and then the players will go to New York where they're going to play the tournament, usually in Cincinnati. They're going to play at the U.S. Open site and then play the U.S. Open. Uh, at the moment, we're planning on playing it with no fans. Uh, that is the plan. We hope that as the situation continues to improve, that we can allow some amount of fans to come. There's families and people who've been coming to this event for decades and other people we'd like to give a special treat to after a tough year to be able to come. Um, so we'll, but we'll just have to see about that. Well, team sports are ones where the kind of a coach can kind of, or the, can kind of say to the players, you do this, you do that, you're working for me more or less. But tennis is kind of different. So how do you keep tennis players from doing the kind of things they shouldn't be doing? And how can you be sure that they're going to be healthy? Yeah, I mean, look, the tennis players, they have a big self-interest in remaining healthy. And so most of them have actually been quarantining and practicing and staying fit. They're eager to come back. They haven't made money. They haven't competed. They haven't uh, got ranking points. Uh, for the last four or five months. And if you look on social media, you'll see that most of them have been taking good care of themselves, training hard. And I'll tell you, David, they are so eager to come back since we made this announcement. We've been inundated uh, with people, uh, top players from all over the world who want to come to Washington. So uh, they, they, they do it for themselves, but they have a big interest in staying healthy. Now, World Team Tennis, you own the Washington Castles. So they're going to be playing their games where? So uh, World Team Tennis is going to play their entire season at the Greenbrier. Uh, Phil, I think, accurately described the mindset that all sports are going through of creating a bubble. That's what we're doing at the City Open. That's what they're going to do in New York at the City Open, I mean, at the U.S. Open. And then uh, World Team Tennis is going to create a three-week bubble at the Greenbrier where all the teams will go play there. And, um, and it's actually, I think it'll be a terrific season for them. 
Now, you also own a company called Lindblad, or your public company that you, you control is, uh, owns Lindblad. I guess there are no tours around the world right now. Is that right? Yeah, so I'm, I'm chair of the company. We made a big investment um, in it f five years ago. Yeah, and Lindblad's an incredible company. We take people on incredible trips on small ships to the world's most amazing places, the Poles, Galapagos, Alaska, the Nile, Amazon. And unfortunately, we've literally went from a $350 million revenue annual rent revenue run rate to zero since March. But we've been working hard. I mean, it's interesting as you look across a portfolio of companies, David, which I know you do too, every business is impacted by the COVID crisis. For some, it's a, it's a crisis and for some, it's an opportunity. For Lindblad, it's obviously an issue. But we created a partnership with the University of Washington and have developed protocols where we're hopeful that we're gonna be able to take people on our trip soon with trips of only 100, 150 people uh, we think we'll actually be able to test people before they come on board and then create a similar bubble to what we're talking about in sports and hopefully get back in business soon. So, Mark, um, you also own the company called Castle. I guess it's Castle Security. So lots of buildings, like thousands of buildings in the United States. You have to use a Castle key to get in. So what are, uh, what are you seeing? Are people coming back to offices? And what are you doing with that company to make things more secure for people? Yeah, I mean, Castle is one of those companies that um, we secure 1,200 buildings in DMV, 620,000 people in our region use it every day. And so Castle is a company that's been highly in demand. We developed a framework called Castle Safe Spaces uh, to make office buildings safe as people come back to work. And there's been tremendous interest in that. There was actually a big article in the New York Times this morning about the work there. Um, but, you know, look, everyone wants to get back to work, but they also want it to be safe. And so we've integrated best practices, work with experts, and created a framework and layered on technology uh, that will make office buildings safer. Um, and people have been really interested in it. Now, Mark, um, I think Roger Federer is maybe 37 or 38, an age that to me is a teenager, but in that sport, it's considered a little bit old. How can he keep playing at that age when people like McEnroe retired in their 20s? Yeah, I mean, that's sort of modern science. And, you know, tennis is a sport that you can that you can play later, as it turns out. I think the age at, with Venus Williams just turned 40, Rogers 38, Serena's 37. They're all competing for Grand Slams. They figured out how to keep their bodies in incredible shape. They limit their schedules a little bit. Um, and then they use their experience. They, you know, if they lose a half a step or a little teeny bit of athleticism, they more than make up with, it, with their experience and strategy. And it's great to see. It's a golden age of tennis with Serena Venus on the women's side and Roger, Rafa, Novak Djokovic on the men's side and a whole new generation behind them on both sides. Uh, tennis is just a terrific sport in great shape. So Mark, you're a, you were a ranked tennis player. I think you told me at one point, number 1,000 or something in the world uh, in doubles. But if you were to play Serena Williams, uh, what would the score be? It, it would not be good, David. That um, it would, I actually have hit with her, um, and it would be it would certainly be six zero six zero. And she's she's uh, you know she's an incredible athlete, a great player. Um, she's a great she's a great role model, and you know I think that touches on David the real reason that we're all talking about returning to sports. Phil talked about the you know the economics are real, but really sports lifts up a community. The psychological impact of having sports back is really important. And I'll tell you that just in the week since we announced the City Open coming back, and even with fans thinking they may not be able to come, people have been so happy that this event is coming back. They'll be able to watch it on TV. They have hope they can watch it in person. But it really lifts up people's spirits. And then there are also incredible platforms uh, to recognize the heroes on the front line through this crisis and also shine a light on some of the social issues we're dealing with as a country. I don't know if you people saw what happened in NASCAR yesterday where there was a horrible incident against the one African-American driver and all the other drivers walked him out, walked his car out to the pit and had a huge moment of solidarity that touched a lot of people. And I, I think that's the power of sports. And that's why it is important to get sports back. Even if it's not what it was, it's really important to get it back um, and, and use the platform for good for a lot of people. I'm glad to hear that you would score the same against Serena Williams as I would. We both have 6-0, 6-0, so I'm basically equal, even with you, right? Okay. Um, Phil, let me ask you, who is the highest paid athlete in the world? 
Well, there's a little bit of uh, dispute over that, but certainly the, the top six in some order or other seem to be you know, the three best soccer players in the world, Ronaldo, Messi, and Neymar, and the two best basketball players, uh, who are LeBron James and, and Steph Curry. And then um, Roger Federer is actually in that top six on most people's count. Uh, this year has been a little bit difficult for him because he's an independent contractor and has to earn a lot of his money on court, but he is certainly one of the highest earners in the world. But the richest person who's ever been playing sports, that's now Michael Jordan because he owns a team that's worth a lot. Is he by far the richest former athlete? Uh, Roger Staubach, I think, has done very well for himself. Magic Johnson has done very well. There are some others, but Michael certainly is among those. And do you think college athletes should be um, compensated uh, in ways that professional athletes are? Uh, in part, yes. I would separate payment for name, image, and likeness, which is now the big uh, issue being discussed, because that's uh, a student athlete just being a person. You know, if you're a, a musician or a scientist, you can get paid for your name, image, and likeness. I am not in favor, on the other hand, of student athletes being paid for playing their sport on the court or on the field. But there's a differentiation between the two. Of all the commissioners of professional sports, who's the most respected? Most respected, I think, is Adam Silver, and there's a singular reason for that. Of course, you know, basketball is very popular and it's global and the economics have been very good, but Adam has made a lot of good decisions that have created a lot of good outcomes without the rancor that you see in most of the other team sports. And which owners in, let's say, basketball or football or baseball are the most respected by or the most influential with their fellow uh, owners? Well, the most respected, I would say, in football are probably the Maras in New York, the Roonies in Pittsburgh, and Arthur Blank in Atlanta. But the most influential may be Robert Kraft and Jerry Jones. In hockey, the most respected is uh, maybe Jeremy Jacobs in Boston. And I would also put Ted Leonsis in that group, particularly for his uh, savvy in marketing and his knowledge about uh, technology and his expertise in bringing a community together. Um, in baseball, there's maybe a bigger group that includes the Steinbrenner family, Jerry Reinsdorf, Magic Johnson and the group in, in LA, uh, John Henry um, and others. And um, uh, I mean, we can go sport by sport, but that's a, that's a good group. So let's suppose I wanted to be an athlete and I wanted to make the highest amount of money I could during my athletic career. What sport would you recommend that I go into? Well, professional sports now have um, opportunities economically, I think across the board and around the world. Uh, so it really depends on size, passion and opportunity. Uh, but the top athletes, male or female, can do very well for themselves. On the female side, the focus in the, in the money is still in the major events. The major women's sports events can compete successfully with the men's major sport events in terms of revenue generation, popularity, visibility. The athletes are not quite there yet, but they've got an upward opportunity as well. I assume the best way to get compensated and make the most amount of money would be to hire Octagon to represent you. Is that your real point, though? I would uh, at least have a conversation with us and give us a chance to explain Okay. So, um, all right, Mark, can you hear me? I can, yep. So, Mark, uh, right now, uh, who is the number one tennis player in the world? Uh, Novak Djokovic on the men's side, and I think it's Ash Barty on the women's side. Okay, and Mark, uh, what trip that Lindblad, Lindblad offers is the most exotic? So, um, I'm known for exotic traveling. Uh, I go to New York all the time. I go to uh, Los Angeles and places like that. But if I wanted to go somewhere really exotic, where is the place that you would take me that is the most exotic where I could come back? You mean beyond Palm Beach, David? Right. Right. Yeah, someplace beyond Palm <laughs> Beach where I'd likely to come back alive. Where, where, would I, where would I go? Well, we actually just had completed construction of the most incredible expedition ship ever built. We took delivery of it at the end of March, just as COVID started, um, called the Endurance, which is the most ice-breaking capable passenger ship ever built. And we were gonna 
it would take people to Arctic and Antarctic, but it would take it on routes that people usually can't go because of the ice breaking capabilities. That's one of the trips that we're hopeful to get people on. We believe that if we can test people uh, before you go on, you can feel safe about it. And, and I do think, David, as people have been sitting in their houses for a long, long time, there is a huge desire to get out as long as they can do it in a safe way. And we think trips like this that are small and safe where people are tested is, is something people are going to be interested in. But Arctic, Antarctic, the Nile, Amazon, Galapagos, all these places are extraordinary. Mark, I should have mentioned you were inducted into the Washington Business Hall of Fame, I think in 2018. Who was the person that introduced you and what is her interesting background? Well, thank you. Yeah, it's my mom, David, and uh, she's my hero. She's an extraordinary woman. You know her. Um, she's actually uh, one of two of the youngest surviving twins of the Holocaust, so she's lived an amazing life. But David, as you know her, you know, she lives every day with an incredible amount of light and optimism. And uh, so she's my hero. And the truth is, David, is they really asked, they asked me to have you introduce me because actually you are the reason I came back to Washington. And I'm really grateful for that. And you're also one of my business heroes, but they really were pushing for you. And I really pushed for my mom. And uh, when it was done, I hate to say it, but they thought it was a good idea. She's pretty inspirational in, uh, in her own way. Mark, you made the right decision. <laughs> uh, Mark and Phil, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh